Thanks very much. It's a huge pleasure to be here, and I'm so excited there's so many people here. Um, what I'd like to do is, following on from Gordon, is to actually take this idea of technology um, and what we as scientists and technologists uh, might do to help with uh, existing programs in, in the developing world. Um, it all came about about five years ago when I was writing a book called Tomorrow's People, which was focusing on the impact of science and technology on how people are thinking. I'm by training a neuroscientist. And I went through the three technologies that Gordon's been mentioning, information technology, biotechnology, nanotechnology. And some of the conclusions were pretty scary. Some were very exciting. Some were deeply philosophical, if you like, um, because it really challenged uh, the very fundamentals by which we live our lives. And it wasn't until I got to the end, I thought, well, hang on a bit. Here we are in a world already with people with Prozac and Botox and PlayStation thumbs. In the future, there'll be people, possibly, rightly or wrongly, with enhanced genes, so-called transhumanist developments where uh, we can empower ourselves physically and mentally with uh, artificial devices, whether we like that or not. You'll have to buy the book. Um, but uh, it got to me and I thought, well, hang on. And then there's other people in the world who are living on less than a dollar a day or who don't have access to drinking water. And isn't this a serious problem? Because we're going to have the techno-haves and the techno-have-nots that might present a divide the like of which we have never seen before, even in the worst days of colonial powers. We might have a world um, divided by not just technology, but almost a speciation, a deviation of people, the so-called enhanced people, rightly or wrongly, and the naturals or something like this. And uh, so alarming were these thoughts, I thought, well, I can't just end the book on this gloomy note. You know, I can't just end saying, well, that's, you know, there we go. Um, we'll just sleepwalk into this, you know. Um, so I ended with a rather naive idea because I'll be the first to put my hand up and with many of you who I'm sure are experts in the developing world um, with aid programs and the like, I am a naive scientist. I'm a neuroscientist. What do I know? But it did strike me um, that perhaps uh, we shouldn't just sleepwalk into this or just let it happen and that we should think about ways in which we could, in whatever way possible, try and make an effort to combat it. Now, can I ask now, for a show of hands, how many scientists in the room? How many research scientists in the university? Yeah. Okay, so I'm not going to ask you questions. You can put your hands up without fear that you're going to be singled out. Um, so I do want to speak to you guys and ask whether you feel the same as me. Don't you feel that as scientists in universities, especially in the public sector, our main worry is to get grants? Yeah? Yeah, everyone's nodding. Grants, yeah. Main worry is how much lab space you have. Your main worry is are you going to get a paper published? And you end up pursuing it's a, a sort of the equivalent of historian Oliver Cromwell 1602 to 1602 and a half or something you know so the science equivalent of that you know I'm glad to see they're nodding and it struck me that that this was a shame um, because for many scientists there you are um, worrying about the science equivalent of Oliver Cromwell 1602 1602 if, if, if indeed that is when he lived I don't know um, you know, so, sorry that to tell me I'm talking rubbish um, so you know you're worried about all that um, and Meanwhile, this wonderful scientific innovation and curiosity, which is what is at the heart of science, gets sort of dried up and stifled by worries about audits with HEFSI and the research assessment exercise. Again, those of you who are not academics might know, know what I'm talking about, but this is invented in Hades by the government <laughs> to do this. Um, you worry about being audited, you're worried about increased teaching loads, you're worried about not hanging out for money, and there you are like a hamster in a wheel till you're 65. And I paint a gloomy picture here, perhaps you know, somewhat of a caricature, but I, I think it might strike a chord for some. So it struck me that what a waste of talent, what a waste of innovation, what a waste of what science is supposed to do, which is think of unusual ways around problems. As someone once said, science is seeing what everyone else can see, but thinking what no one else has thought. And it struck me that perhaps this wonderful curiosity and talent, rather than being stifled by the RAE, could at least in part be harnessed for the good of stopping this divide of the techno-haves and have-nots. Like I said, a naive idea, but who cares about it being naive? I'd rather be naive than um, cynical. So anyway, um, I wrote this book and thought no more of it because that's the most you can do if you're a one person. Someone once said the difference between a vision and a delusion is whether you have people behind you or not. <laughs> yeah? And I was uh, at the delusional stage at that stage. Um, Anyway, I gave a talk like you do as scientists, and in the audience was someone I'd never met before who came up afterwards and introduced himself as Justin Anderson um, in front. You're, you're about to meet Justin in a minute. 
And Justin was into IT, and I was very impressed with that because you're always impressed by technologies you don't understand yourself. And I was very excited by this. And we went and had lunch, and he said, I've read your book, and um, I want to help. And that's where the delusion became a vision, if you like. And so we started thinking about how we might actually practically do something, and Justin was the first person to actually start up a, a website. Um, and then it was at that time I met Andrew Doman, who's also in the front, who you'll meet from McKinsey's, who also added great value because he could see ways, practical ways of implementing and starting this. And so, um, as it was called then the Science Corps, now it's called Science for Humanity. That's how it started to come into being. And we three were the, were the initial trustees who started this off. And I'd like to just, on a personal note, thank Justin and Andrew for doing this, um, for believing in it, and for taking some airy-fairy academic idea, which is what it was with my naive uh, take on things, to develop it into something that actually <coughs> had legs and teeth. I don't know what metaphor we want to use, but it had both legs and teeth. I don't know about the middle body, but, you know, that's a... Um, so um, it was at that stage then that I started to see that it was going to actually be something that could actually benefit. It wasn't just an idea, it was a, a reality. And it was at that time that we then had the team of Philip Rowley and Alex Eve, who came on, who I'm sure you know, and David Grimshaw. We've now been joined by two new trustees, Simon Trace, the CEO of Practical Action, and Julia Goodfellow. Um, so we're starting to have a very exciting lineup with all of us having different takes, different skills, um, to try and bring together a dialogue. And someone once said, can you sum up Science for Humanity in one or two sentences? And I think it's this, which is that we have NGOs who are familiar with technologies, who are very familiar, as we've just heard, with the culture um, and the issues in various parts of the world. And then you have the scientists, like I am and was, in the ivory tower, worried about the RAE, worried about my grants, but with some spark one hopes of innovative insight. And what we're about is bringing those two groups together. So the idea is that the scientists have technologies of which the NGOs may not be aware and which they could cherry pick and adapt and use for issues of the type that you heard Gordon outline. Similarly, there may be problems in the developing world that if the scientists had a quick sniff of them and a look at them, all scientists love solving problems in novel ways. And it may be that if they were given this problem, it could be something that could engage someone part-time on the web. It doesn't have to be that you, in my initial idea, I thought people could go out there for a year, but I think much more of value would be for people to look at these ideas when they have spare time um, or making time so that as a community, as a scientific community globally, we could actually look at some of the problems that are currently still there that the NGOs can bring us. So basically, it's to act as an agency or a, a conduit between NGOs in the developing world and, and scientists in their ivory towers. And I do say ivory towers unflinchingly and without any apologies because I think that's what many of us are still doing. Um, so that's what really we're all about. And wonderfully, um, of course, there's, you, you, may, you scientists may notice the missing link here. We've got a wonderful lineup of talents, wonderful lineup of people. What is missing <laughs> is money. And of course, you can't do anything without that. And so that's why Nestor and Sloan Robinson have been so fantastic. And again, having faith and again, providing the basis um, for making the vision actually materialize now into a reality. So I think really the adventure is just beginning. Um, it's been an amazing journey so far where we've literally bootstrapped up from nothing. And I think the reason that's happened is because it really means something, it's really important. And everyone who's so far been involved has bought into the idea, has got excited by it, and has taken it one step further with their particular talents and expertise and skills. And the whole point of this evening <coughs> is that we are now appeal to you, scientists, NGOs, related organizations, to help us take it now even a step further so we really can start doing good things. So thank you very, very much for coming. And I'll hand over to Justin to explain how you can do good things. Thank you very much.